uh, starting last week, we started a new series called First Things First. And, and it's a series about priorities. All of us have to figure out what is important in our lives. Here's what I know about your calendar. If you don't fill it with the things that you know you're to be doing, somebody else will come along and fill it for you. In fact, if you show me your calendar, I can pretty much tell you what your priorities are. If you really want to be transparent, show me your checkbook. For those of you that are younger, checkbook is a thing that, that you had, it's paper, and you write out and you give it to somebody and they give you money. It's really, it's really a cool, cool tool. But, but you show me your online banking and I'll tell you, I can tell what your priorities are. All of us shape our priorities because we make decisions every day about what's important to us. We make decisions about relationships. We make decisions about work. We make decisions about our participation in church. Every day we make those decisions. So when it comes to what is first, putting first things first, then it's important for us to figure out what does scripture say is important. And then rather than me trying to adjust it to meet my needs, then I have to figure out how do I make adjustments in order to make what Jesus said was important, important. So last week we looked at the priority of prayer and how prayer connects us with the creator of the universe. Prayer is not just an exercise to keep us busy until Jesus returns. Prayer is the privilege God gives us to communicate with him. We can speak to him. He speaks to us. Now, not in an audible voice, but he speaks to our hearts. And so Jesus said, this is how you pray. This is why it's important that you pray. Because you need to stay connected you see, we live in a world that is more connected today than it's ever been. I can connect with people that I know in South Asia instantly. In fact, there are some of them staying up tonight. It's tonight there, and, and they're watching this message. And, and I'm grateful for that. And we can stay connected that way, unlike ever before. We used to, we had to write letters. My wife has all of those letters I wrote to her while I was way, way from her, 300 miles away. There was no internet, no phones, no cell phones. There were phones, but there were cell phones were not invented yet. And, and I, I didn't keep any of hers, but she kept all of mine. Now, guys, I need you to understand, if you can find that stash, seize it, because it's incriminating. Every once in a while, these gals like to take them out and go, where, where was this guy who was longing to see me, who can't wait to the next time we're together, who thinks of me, oh, where, where did this guy go? We're more connected now than we've ever been. And we can stay connected as much as we want to, sometimes too much. Some of you need to disconnect from time to time from your phones uh, because what? They are your priority. And when they become your priority, it steals us away from the things that are important. So we're going to look again today in that message that Jesus was giving that we started last week in Matthew chapter 6. And so we're going to pick up again in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look starting in verse 19. But when we surrender to Jesus as Lord, the moment he is truly Lord of our lives, then he should get all of us. Surrender means everything. I give up everything, particularly when you have, let's say in, in war, you have an unconditional surrender. And the party that's surrendering is saying, I can't place any conditions on this surrender. So you're going to do what you want to because I'm not in a position to come against it. I tried to come against it and I lost. 
And so I surrender. When we surrender to Jesus as Lord, we, we have to understand this saying that you've heard me say many times. He either, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He can't be a little bit your Lord. Because the moment everything is not surrendered to him, he's no longer Lord. Does that make sense? So when we talk about first things first, then what we want to make sure is that we are aligning ourselves with the priorities that Jesus has established. So let's look in that sixth chapter. We're going to pick up with verse 19. And if you can't find it in your Bible, it's on page uh, uh, 969 in my Bible. Um, but it's on the screen for you. Don't collect for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And so if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can be a slave of two masters since he will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and money. When we look at these words of Jesus, then we understand his theology of things. And so there are four things that I want to point out about this passage that I think will be important to us. And the first is this, listen to what Jesus says about money. Listen to what Jesus says about money. Here's what he says in verse 19. Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy, where thieves can break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven. And none of that's going to happen to the treasures that you're building up in heaven. So what is he saying? Well, let me tell you what he's not saying first. What Jesus is not saying is that all money is evil. What Jesus is not saying is that you should not provide for your family or that you should not save for retirement. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is, where is your priority? What is it that's most important? Scripture admonishes us to take care of our family. In fact, if you don't, you're worse than an infidel, Scripture says. So we, we need money. All ministry operates from the resources of those who are a part of that ministry. There's nothing that we do in the form of missions or evangelism or benevolence that doesn't require money to operate. So money is not the problem. The problem is the priority toward money. And that's what Jesus is attempting to address in this section of Scripture. He is saying to us to evaluate our motives for getting what we have. So what do we think about money? What position does money have in our life? In the hierarchy of our priorities, where does money and treasures fit, or you can put possessions there just as easily. Now, James comes along and echoes what Jesus says in James 5, verses 1 through 3. He says, come now, you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming to you. Your wealth is ruined, your clothes are moth-eaten, your silver and gold are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up treasure in the last days. Rather than being concerned about what is gonna happen with the kingdom of God in the last days, you're concerned about money. You're concerned about 
holding on to it. A lot of times in my flesh, I will say, you know, I wish we could reach a few more millionaires. But I got to tell you, people that are millionaires get to be millionaires because they don't give away their money. They collect it. They're not in the business of giving it away. Now, once you become a billionaire, it's more than you're ever gonna spend, so they start figuring out how to give it away. But I'm just saying, it's not a matter of getting people that make more money. It's a matter of having the people God has already here being faithful with the resources that God has provided. And we have to figure out, we've got to evaluate why am I accumulating? Is it to provide for my family? That's a good thing. Is it so that I can be a worker that is approved? Yes, that's a good thing. But if it is simply to accumulate, then it becomes a problem. And Jesus focuses us on that problem. So what should we do instead? Well, we should focus on building the kingdom with our possessions. Pastor Mike spent four weeks talking about the significance of the kingdom and why the kingdom of God is important to us and why we should focus on what it's going to take to establish the kingdom of God because that's what is happening until Jesus returns. His kingdom is going to be established and when his kingdom is done, when it's ready, and he returns. So what are we going to be found busy with when he returns? Proverbs 23 says it this way in verse four and five. Don't wear yourselves out to get rich. Stop giving your attention to it. As soon as your eyes fly to it, it disappears. For it makes wings for itself and flies like an eagle to the sky. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, the more you focus on things, when you get those things, they never bring what you thought they would bring to your life. You never, it was never as satisfying as you thought it would be. During the sabbatical, I spent uh, two weeks in Kauai. And if you've ever been to Kauai, you understand that the, the state bird of Kauai is a chicken, unofficially. And there are chickens, wild chickens everywhere. I mean, you don't, you don't go anywhere without there being chickens running around, I, which is particularly one of our favorite places to eat there is called chicken in the barrel. How many of you have ever eaten chicken in the barrel? It, it's just 55-gallon drums that they cook chicken. It's amazing barbecue chicken. And there at chicken in the barrel, which is happening outside and you're eating there and you can see the barrels and it's just a wonderful barbecue smoke flavor and you see chickens running around that barrel. And you're wanting to go, hasn't your buddies told you to stay away from here? I've never seen a kid who didn't try to catch the, one of those chickens. My grandkids were there and my two grandsons. And, and by the way, my oldest grandson has chickens. He's got about 20 chickens. He, we call him the chicken whisperer, but they could not catch any one of those chickens. Those chickens are wild. And where we were staying around this courtyard area is an ancient burial ground. And there's signs, please do not uh, cross beyond this barrier. You know, please respect our, eld our uh, ancestors. And, and so it's, it's got some little trees and shrubs and it's well manicured. Nobody goes in there except the chickens. Because the chickens have figured out they can escape little boys by going to the, those burial grounds because after all, chickens don't read and they don't know they're not supposed to be there and they get up in those little short stubby trees and that's where they roost away from the small humans. I watched not only my kid, grandkids, but other grandkids and they all have the same urge. They see those chickens, they think they can catch them, but as soon as they get to them, they fly away. Chickens can fly, by the way. And here's what he's saying. The illusion of wealth is the same way. The moment you think you're about to grab it, the moment you think you're gonna catch it, it flies away. And what you thought was 
going to be fulfilling. It's not fulfilling. It's empty. And so Jesus is trying to redirect our thoughts into priorities, and the priorities are going to be around the importance of the kingdom. The second thing Jesus says here is to watch what gets your attention. Look at verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Whatever is important to you, whatever grabs your attention will also grab your heart. If you were to take a few moments and, and prioritize the various aspects of your life, before long, you would be able to decide what is most important to you. You would see it in the time you take thinking about it or participating in it. Whatever gets your attention gets you. It gets your heart. And Jesus is saying this is the fallacy of wealth. Not that wealth is evil in and of itself, but once it gets your attention, it also gets your heart. And it, it, it's not a good thing when that takes place. And so Jesus is asking us to not allow these things to control us. Don't allow your things to garner all your attention. Because the moment you are paying more attention to the things, that means you're paying less attention to the kingdom of God and building it and being his servant and obeying what he has to say to you. All of us are susceptible to this trap. It's easy. Look, 1 Timothy, and this is that the end of that first letter that Paul writes to his protege, Timothy. And he says in verse eight, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap. And many foolish and harmful desires will plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Now, often this passage is misquoted. You'll hear people say, well, money is the root of all evil. And that's not correct. That's not what Timothy heard. That's what Paul said. He said, the love of money is the root of all evil. When it becomes more important than the things of God, then it creates a problem. And I like how this translation puts it by craving it. When, when it moves from just, this is a tool, it's necessary, I need to buy groceries, I need to buy shelter, I need to prepare for the future, I need to do these things, and money is the vehicle that lets me do those things. But when we begin to crave it, now it sets up something different in our heart. And it's easy, it's easy for money to get our attention. But listen, that can change. It may be possible that up to this point, money has had such a big, big part of your thinking or your process, your everyday waking hours, all the things of your goals, uh, of, of, of accumulation of wealth, accumulation of possessions, all of those things may have been the priority in your life. And at some point we wake up and say, wait a minute, there are things more important to this. And while I'm going to continue to earn money, I'm not telling anybody here to quit earning money or even quit saving money. I'm not saying that at all. And I don't think Jesus is either. It's what has our attention. But what gets us gets our heart. And we begin to be zeroed in on the wrong thing. Rather than taking your ability to earn wealth and using it for kingdom purposes, by your generosity, by giving to ministry, then it's kept to yourself. It's for your own purposes rather than for God's purposes. And so we have to consciously make a different decision. Some of you right now, even to think about tithing, a tithe means 10th, giving 10% 10 of your income. For some of you, that is absolutely mind-boggling. 
that anybody would ever be able to do that. But it's because we have lapsed into a mode of thinking about giving the way we think about tipping after a good meal. Wow, Lord, you really blessed me. Whew, take this tip. Rather than saying, whether you bless me or not, Father, all of this is yours. I'm just your steward. And so I'm returning the first fruits to you. It's yours. It's already yours. See, it's a different mindset. There's a third thing I think is important for us to grab out of the passage, and that is to live life in the light. Live life in the light. Jesus now switches the imagery, and he uses the eye as an example. In verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. With all the hurricane talk and the tropical storm and Stormwatch 2020, some of you went, I better check and see if I have a flashlight. And then you found your flashlight and you went, hmm, I better check and see if there's any batteries. And so you ran down to Albertsons and there were no D batteries. Not that I know that. <laughs> Actually, I checked my battery supply. I had nine D batteries waiting in my refrigerator. I keep batteries in the refrigerator. I'm kind of a closet prepper. He's talking about how we perceive light. And he says the eye is the lamp, the lamp of the body, the flashlight of the body. What does he mean? If your eye is good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness so if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? At the age of 48, I was not seeing as well as I thought I should have. It just things seemed a little blurry, and I, I was concerned. I, I didn't wear glasses till I was about 44, and now it's just a few years later, and it just seems like my eyesight is just kind of headed downhill. And so I go, and they look at that, the guy comes back and says, you have cataracts. I'm going, cataracts? That's supposed to be when I get 80, 90. Is that supposed to be at the end? I'm 48. I don't need cataracts at 48. He goes, yeah. Well, the good news is you have both eyes. <laughs> and so we're going to need to take those off. And I'm going, okay, time out here. You say take those off. Are you going to wash them off? I mean, what, what's going to happen here? He goes, oh, well, we cut them off. <laughs> You're going to cut them off. my. Yeah, we're going to cut them off. And just what surgeon's going to do that? No surgeon's going to do that. We're going to do it with a laser. Oh, yeah, now we're going to put a laser to my eyeball. That sounds like a really good thing to me. I guess, yeah. He said, you know those little floaty things you've got? How many of y'all have those little floaty things? You know, you can look up and they're always moving. They're always going. And you try to capture them and everywhere you capture them, they keep going. Okay, I'm the only one that has those. Okay, you have them. He said, while we're at it, we're going to blast those suckers. Really? You're going to take a laser, cut off cataracts, and then go through my eye and and knock out some, this is, this is like, I can just see a guy going, oh, game over, he's blind. Uh, I, I, I just had to get my head around this. And he said, oh, by the way, while we're in there, we're gonna make just a little cut and we're gonna slide a lens in there and you'll have far vision. Really? So we're going to cut off a cataract. We're going to blast floaties. And we're going to cut my eyeball open and put a lens in. Yeah. Okay. When they took those iPads off, that's weird. I just heard that word, iPad. When they took the iPads off, I cannot tell you how brilliant color was. I mean, I, I did not realize how dull some of you looked. 
And they took those things off and it was like, I can see clearly now the rain is falling. I mean, it was amazing. Why? Because everything we see, everything we see is a reflection of light. The reason I know this gentleman has a red shirt is that the light is reflecting off of that. If we shut off the lights, I don't see that red shirt anymore. I don't see anything anymore if I shut off enough light. Color is a reflection of light. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying the eye is the lamp of the body. If it's dim, if there's cataracts, then the light can't come in. And therefore, we are living in darkness. For us to have the right priority of the things of God, the things that he wants us to do, we have to be living in the light. That's what Jesus is saying and challenging us to step up. In other words, we need, the, the King James would say, the scales to fall off of our eyes. That's a cataract. We need those cataracts to be taken off of our eyes spiritually so that all of a sudden we're seeing everything in vivid color of what God has for us to do. What does it mean to live in the light? It means that the material things, we see them for what they really are that they're just means to an end. The end is the kingdom. But God allows us to accumulate things so that God's kingdom can be advanced. Living in the light means that we see the world from God's point of view, not just from a secular way. We don't treat each other the way we, sh we treat each other when we are seeing with the light of God. Things change. We love people that are not so lovable. We minister to people that we wouldn't even think of before. Living in the light means we also see what God wants us to do. We now know our assignment. We know why we're here. We know what we're supposed to do. And so the priority of, of getting our possessions into right perspective allows us to be people of light. There's one last thing that Jesus wants us to know about that, and that is we've got to decide which master to serve. Verse 24 says, no one can be a slave of two masters since he will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and money. So we have to ask ourselves some questions. What or who you, are you putting your hope in? What are you putting your hope in or who are you putting your hope in? It's a legitimate question. Later in that same letter to Timothy, the apostle Paul says in verse 17, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. When we have the right priority, and God is able to move resources in and out. And so, so we become a river instead of a reservoir. God is able to use that in powerful ways. And so either you master your money and possessions or they will master you. There are decisions we have to make every day about that. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10 says this, the one who loves money is never satisfied with money and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. Regardless of what you think is gonna make you happy, once you get there, that's not gonna be it. But when we align ourselves with the kingdom of God, when we are pleasing to God in what we do with our resources, then it brings genuine joy. It brings genuine fulfillment because we know that we're doing what God has called us to do. So what is our next step? Our next step then is to listen to what Jesus says about money and choose to serve the right master. That is a choice that each one of us can make today.
Many of you made that choice years ago. But if you haven't, maybe today is your day. The reality is that none of this takes place until we surrender to Jesus as Lord of our lives. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means you, it means me, and that separates us from God. But God loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have an eternal life. And God wants to give you that eternal life, and it begins now. We begin enjoying the life of the kingdom right now when we align our priorities with his. So in just a moment, our worship team is going to come back and lead us in a time of commitment. And we're going to have an opportunity for you to come to this altar. Maybe you want to simply kneel and pray at one of these chairs, or maybe you want to pray here at the altar or pray with one of us. Maybe today is the day that you want to surrender to Jesus as Lord I'm going to ask you to stand and I want you to bow your heads and we're going to pray together and our worship team will lead us. Father, we thank you for this moment and that, Father, we give ourselves to you. We surrender to you as Lord and we ask, Father, that you would help us to put the priorities surrounding our possessions in the right order. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to today's message. You can connect more with Magnolia Church on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at magonline.com. If you're interested in partnering with us financially to help us continue spreading this message of good news, you can do so at magonline.com slash give.